My child, so beautiful to behold. How do you feel? Feeling better, kiddo? I killed him. Isa. Did you know? I'm confused. I thought I was... I know. Forgive me. This is who you really are, a Tenno. More than human, but once a child like any other. What do you remember? I remember everyone was laughing outside an airlock. This kid had a boy by the throat. I didn't think it was funny at all. Is that how you remember it? Yes. Good. Memories. From your time aboard the Zeraman 10 before the Void Jump accident. Sweet prophet, the moon exists. It, it was in the Void all along. I knew the Lotus was powerful, but this, she erased history. We thought it was destroyed all this time. <sighs> my, my, Lotus, you make a fine villain. Hey all, Siege here, and today, well, today I think it's time to take a more extensive look at our own space mom, the Lotus, because I feel like she has quietly been one of the more fleshed out characters in Warframe recently, but at the same time, we still know probably a lot less than we should given how long she's been with us. As many of you remember, there was a time not so long ago when she was being considered by the community more and more as an enemy than an ally. In the end, well, I'm not sure I'm really sold on either. In truth, her ups and downs are almost as extensive as the player characters, and I think it can be argued that hers is even more extreme and confusing at times. It's interesting that the information given here in the official codex is so non-committal on the subject, ending the passage by specifically making mention of this with her reach is far, her allies are many, but her ultimate intentions are of dubious propriety. In large part, I think that's true. And whereas I don't doubt she holds a special allegiance with us, the Tenno, when looked at from a thousand foot view, if you will, that allegiance could be as deep as the one we have with the man on the wall. And when viewed from a particular perspective, there might be a legitimate reason for that. Our very first instance with the Lotus is a good example of this. During the Awakening quest, we are shown events stemming from the assault of the Tenno on the former High Council of the Orkin, those known as the Seven where the Tenno massacre the orc and governing body, and even though the Lotus apparently has knowledge of this event, to this day, the Tenno strangely only have bits and pieces of information regarding what actually happened. Why the Tenno actually turned on the orc is still somewhat of a mystery, and further, why the Tenno were essentially put to sleep for countless centuries, as well as why they were awakened now. But at that point in our journey, so much has happened so fast that none of this is ever really questioned. So we just assume her to be a faceless ally and begin to move from planet to planet, bringing our own form of justice back to the soul system until we get to Uranus and find a peculiar looking creature scanning for something or someone. What did you see? My data stream went dark. Upon further inspection, the Lotus realizes these are remnants of her former kin and abandons the Tenno without any explanation. I'm putting this stream together now. It is, it is an Oculist. That means, I'm sorry, Tenno, stay safe. The burden of which ends up falling on Teshin. And even he is suspicious of her true intentions. So, pupil, the spring has ended. The lotus blossom has snapped shut. Her true nature revealed now. We shall see if codependence can be broken. Let us begin to unravel her long-hidden truth. He too is another entity that seems to have knowledge of what happened in the past, but is also reluctant to say much outside of tiny bits of cryptic dialogue. Nonetheless, we continue on searching for what these sentient drones and now the Grenier are after, and all of us come to find that this search has unknowingly awakened a massive, powerful sentient, that being the destroyer of worlds known as Hunhao. The Lotus conveniently enough reemerges at this point and finally explains to the Tenno who she really was. Nata, Lotus, you cannot hide this past any longer. There are gaps. I had my mission, and I have completed it. All but the last sequence. To destroy the Tenno. The war was over. 
So I hid them away. A second dream. I could not destroy them. And yet, you were born to. So tell me, what made you stop to reject your nature? All missions to the Origin System required a sacrifice. Me and my kind become barren when crossing the gap. It is the one flaw we never overcame. Nata wanted children of her own. Nata was the daughter until I destroyed her. Now, I am the Lotus. I am the mother. But this information is really only given because of what Teshin and Han Hao already revealed. We have little time to contemplate the magnitude of what we've learned due to Han Hao's awakening, however, as he has enlisted the help of another mysterious enemy, the Stalker, imbuing him with his own sentient will as well as the powerful sword War during the second dream quest. Again, important pieces of information regarding the Tenno's history are forced out due to necessity, including the nature of the Tenno, the existence of Lua, and that the reservoir that the actual Tenno reside in has now become exposed due to the moon re-emerging into the soul system, with it being implied that the Lotus is the one who had originally hit it. It's only after defeating the Stalker that we finally come face to face with the Lotus for the first time. And it's important to note that during this first actual dialogue with her physical presence, she asks us some very specific questions before having the Tenno reveal all that we can curiously now remember, giving some credence to the idea that the Void may have something to do with our lack of any kind of memory of our past. This leads us to the War Within, where we find Teshin looking over our transference pods and offering us a stern warning not to follow him, which of course we disregard, a decision that will probably be the most important one the Tenno will ever make chasing after him to find the Grenier Queens and more truths that the Lotus kept from us. But, in fairness, this is an observation Teshin has been making for quite some time. And during the quest, the Tenno are forced into their greatest battle yet, a battle within themselves in order to unlock the true power they possess, something Teshin seems to believe the Lotus purposely kept from them. And this is really the first time in the story continuity that the Operator questions the intentions of the Lotus. A mother wants to shield her child from the evils of the world. Margulis didn't lie to you. She protected you. But isn't it better I know the truth? Wouldn't you want to know? Teshin said... Teshin thinks he knows better. Maybe he does. Maybe you needed to know to survive the Queens. But you are changed now. That's what you have to say? That I'm changed? What? You didn't have a choice. Terror. You were only just a... Don't. Don't do that. Don't make excuses for me. Now from here, we come to the Chains of Harrow and learn even more about the Lotus through Paladino. I don't understand. How would Rel know about the dream? Great sentient queen, forgive me. But what you are... What you've made of yourself is merely drawn from the dreams of these divine children. You are not she. You are not Margulis. What are you saying? That Rel is a Tenno? Impossible. All Tenno are known to me. I protect them as she did. Oh, but not Rel. Margulis cast him out, for he was different. Our foremothers took him in and studied his teachings. We became the veil, the shroud of his blessed existence. Cast out. I don't believe you. Now how Paladino knows this is never really mentioned, but it's a good bet that this knowledge is known by Rel, given that he seems to hold ill feelings towards Margulis, the Tenno, and even the dream itself. Not having been a part of it due to interference from either or both of them. How he knows this is probably the more pressing question. Unless, of course, the void is as much a window as it is a path. Something I think explains a great many things within this universe. Regardless, the revelations of Chains of Hera lead into the Apostasy Prologue, where the Tenno are led back to the moon from what appears to be a direct message and even guidance to the Reservoir on Lua from the Lotus herself, where we learn that Ballas, Margulis' former lover and executor to the Seven is in fact alive. I... Forgive me. 
For what? I am not who you think I am. But of course you are. Imprisoned, just as she was. Ballas. I will not abandon you again, Margulis. Worse, the Lotus is more than willing to follow him and leave the Tenor to fend for themselves. Another vision at the beginning of the sacrifice quest has the Tenor lured to the moon in order to find the remnants of the very unique Warframe that she destroyed at what appears to be the behest of Ballas. Over the course of locating, reconstructing, and finally claiming it as our own, we come to learn a few very important pieces of data most prominent of which being how the Tenno are able to utilize the Warframes. This quest shows a detailed encounter of how regular soldiers and humans were many times ruthlessly injected and turned into the bio-war suits we know them as now, with the Tenno being able to bond with them on an emotional level. And it was not their force of will, not their void devilry, not their alien darkness. It was something else. It was that somehow, from within the derelict horror, they had learned a way to see inside an ugly, broken thing. And take away its pain. And thus this shared metaphysical energy is expressed through the Warframe's unique skill sets and immortality. The other thing the ten are exposed to here are the Mimics. Sentients who have the curious ability to take the shape of another entity, something we come to find is the calling card of Nata, the Mimic Queen as she's often called. She has retaken this form at the end of the quest, where she saves a fallen Ballas once we are able to overcome him using the Umra Warframe. The truth of the Great Betrayal comes into focus here as we learn it was Ballas who gave Hunhao the location of the Reservoir on Lua in the hopes that he would have destroyed us. And just as we are about to get both our and Umbra's revenge, the Lotus appears and explains her current truth, that this is what she really is, although that will be highly debatable as time passes. After completing the quest, we have a visit from the man on the wall, and I think it's important to remember the specific questions he asks. Feeling better, kiddo? Is that how you remember it? Seem familiar? How do you feel? What do you remember? This then leads to the Chimera Prologue, where the man in the wall directs us right back into Lua using the exact same method the Lotus used, and I mean they are identical outside of the color, even showing us what appears to be Lotus doppelgangers amidst a burning environment, and then into her chambers with the same type of narration regarding her betrayal by Ballas in front of the Orc and High Council. Somehow the Tenno are then transported directly into the sentient ship where Ballas is being hidden and portrayed as being imprisoned, now part sentient himself. He leads us to believe that he's just speaking in generalities regarding his current situation until he calls out to the Tenno to take a weapon created specifically to kill her, all the while attempting to make us believe that she is the aggressor and that he's merely a pawn with her watchful eye always on him. Our confusion regarding the Lotus intentions becomes a bit clearer during the Jovian Concord, where we come to learn a bit of her origin story as well as what happens within the Reservoir on Lua. So the Golden Wrath came, and after, I was born. A mimic, a spy, conceived to burrow into nests and swallow the pitch eggs of their war machine, the Tenno. But when I saw the tender faces, I took mercy, or so we were told. But in truth, we were both imprisoned in Lyra's belly. My life remained by the creators. I became a memory, a ghost. We programmed to destroy my family, my people, my history. She introduces us to amalgams, a hybrid of soldiers from the corpus and sentience with the inherent weakness of the void overcome by the combination. 
During a battle with a creature specifically created to gauge combat effectiveness against the Tenno, the Ropalolist, we get an extremely disturbing realization, as the Lotus informs us that she has also been visited by the Man on the Wall and potentially that she knows it's him that gives the Tenno their power, something we wouldn't definitively learn until the New War. The next chapter regarding the Lotus is the Era Cinematic, where we see her commanding a group of Tenno to attack her own sentient brother, and along with the Tenno, all seemingly under the Man on the Wall's control, including herself, a red light coming from her visor where normally a bright blue one would be seen. I recognize the enemy. No, sister, it's me, Era. The Makers caught you, unraveled your mind. They're using you to kill us. The Queen of the Aphids, with her eye in the void. But I don't blame you. I blame them. You believe these are your children, but I am the only family you've got left. So choose our family, our people, or these parasites. Choose, Natar. Choose. I am not Natar. I am am the Lotus. It begs the question, if the Lotus that we see here is actually the Lotus, or potentially the Lotus' doppelganger, as the red light would indicate. We're really never given much more, but instead, instant transmission back to the sentient's ship, listening in on a conversation with more important dialogue regarding the nature of the Lotus at this point. Reformation is accelerating. Our conduits are nearly ready. Our rebirth is at hand. And the Golden Spear? How many battalions? Still having lapses? Listen to me. That's the past. The old war. Tell her, Maker. Yes. There is no spear, no uh, Nata. Era speaks. Master Era. My, the Oricon are gone. The bios are divided, in fighting over what remains. Only the Tenno. The Tenno, the enemy. Yes. Made by you to kill us. Yes. You have something our people have never had before, Natar. You're stained by their wickedness. Use it. Use their sin against them. They're listening. Let them. They know we are building. It won't matter. No, it won't. So what are you waiting for? Sing for us, sister. Call them home. The Maker cinematic continues in this very same area, but offers a much different Lotus, one that appears to be almost breaking from a trance, the veil of Era's plan being lifted. So quiet. So dark. It only needs a voice, a spark. But mother, Mother's gone. This is all that remains. But you have her fire. And more. You can finish what she started. Finish the war. Bring peace. Bring purity. On Lua, the Lotus, uh, I attacked you. You remember? You died. Hmm. You don't. 
don't remember everything, then. <clears throat> yes, your aphids wounded me, and our forces were depleting fast. I knew I had failed. Failed you, my sister. Failed our family. I had no choice but to retreat. No. You were destroyed. The Tenno made sure of that. He begins to realize this and forces her into what is assumed to be a link into Pergasa, the mothership of the sentience. Her gift apparently required the power. And this theme continues through Operation Orphix Venom, where during an invasion of the sentience, it appears she's leading combat formations she's calling out. Orphix launch reinforcement across all lanes. Delta sequence A1. M2. Protocol in effect. We require sector control. Do not let them advance. All systems showing D3 degradation. Did not anticipate Necromex. But we will adapt. Adapt next series. Deploying from Y4 quadrant. We cannot be stopped. Deploying squadron I05 to attack vectors. Do not let their old war relics interfere. Four fix N6 series lost. Adjusting repeater deployment algorithm. Entrati interference must be cross control. Segment G7 restarting. Actually, create a secret code meant for the Tenno that she is in fact dying and appears to be asking for our help without Aaron Ballas knowing. All of these things together lead to the new war, where we find the after effects of Era's attack on the Lotus, her Eidolon body barely holding together, getting even weaker once Ballas captures whatever power she has left inside her. How he's able to do this or what this power even is never really gets explained. Regardless, after slicing off the Lotus's hand, she is lost to the void along with our operator and would stay there long enough for Ballas, now under the name Narmer, takes over the entirety of the galaxy. Of course, that's until the Drifter is somehow able to pull her from the void and place her in the orbiter, something else we're never really shown or told about. Only after information and help from Hunhao, the Tenno's originally enemy turned ally, aligning here to save the Lotus, are they able to restore her to her former self culminating in the eventual confrontation of Ballas, where, with our help, she is able to not only overcome him and retake her power, but it's implied she's also able to shield us from the sun and the power of the portal to Tau. It's at this point where the man in the wall shows himself in his true form, and after vanishing, the Lotus falls to the ground, hand burning and drained of power, but not before offering the Tenno a cheeky little smile. This is made more mysterious due to the nature of her withholding what she actually saw at the end. At the end, what did you see? I saw... nothing. Nothing. And knowing what we saw, it really makes me wonder what could make her want to shield us from what she did. This pretty much describes the Lotus's story as it pertains to us. Although, in the Duveri Paradox, it is her hand that is gifted to the Drifter and the major reason he is able to finally overtake Dominus Thrax. Now, in the past I made mention of the fact that I feel the Man on the Wall to be the father figure of the Tenno, one that I feel he's taken on in-game, and I don't think anyone would argue that the Lotus is undoubtedly the mother figure of these children. So, I think in many ways our little family is more unified than we know. Although it's taken literally years of seeing what's going on to get a somewhat decent picture of it. I want to ask a question. Really, I just want to say this aloud, but the question I want to ask is what if the Lotus, or rather Nata, went through the same thing the Tenno did during her initial trip to Tau? Whether or not you want to admit the when of the meeting with the man in the wall, the if is no longer in question given her admittance during the Ropalolis fight. And further, although we can debate the nature of what we see during the era of cinematic, if we're meant to take this as real, 
it would show some kind of similar control the Lotus has over the Tenno to be akin to how the man in the wall does it. And I think the question we have to ask here is who's really in control? This particular scene is one of the most important in the game up to this point, and I think it takes all of these smaller events, the similarities not just between the questions we are asked by both, but also the similar power levels we have with the Lotus, with her really being the only other sentient with gifts on or exceeding that of the Tenno, something Era could be specifically making mention of, believing her to be stained by the evil that Ballas likes to refer to as the Void Devilry. And this is essentially pointing to the man on the wall. Both the Tenno and the Lotus, then as Nata, made trips through the void that left them changed in an extraordinary way. So is it that hard to consider that she had a similar first encounter with him as we did? Maybe that was the light the sentience had to give up in order to survive their trip through the void. Their ability to procreate. A sacrifice, if you will. She could be the sentient representation of what our Tenno is portrayed to be. The duality. A concept heavily implied all over Warframe's universe. And what's the one thing you could tempt the sentience specifically made to take down an empire and destroy their weapons once and for all with, but the exact thing she craved? Children. The only part of the plan that wasn't made into reality. Unless she was just following somebody else's plan, of course. And if, given everything I've presented so far has allowed you to entertain this idea, Consider that the Tenno and the Drifter were essentially saved in both dimensions, Duviri and the trip to the Tau system, using the exact same artifact. The Hand of the Lotus, offered by the man on the wall in one scenario, but I'd say it was more than likely he had a hand in this as well. Get it? The man on the wall has been playing both sides from the very beginning, unraveling the old Orican and sentient dynasties to a shell of what they were. The power vacuum never really being so up for grabs as it is right now. The only thing we're really missing is the why. And further, why is so much of Warframe's lore amongst its most powerful entities always seem to have something to do with severed body parts? Be it the man in the wall's finger, the hand of the Lotus in the new war, but even more disturbing what this same hand does to the drifter's actual human hand peeling it back like a banana peel held together with sentient energy. Gross. And like, he's totally okay with it. What the fuck? This is also the only limb of Dominus Thrax that isn't human. Even Parvos Granum, the de facto leader of the Corpus, being the only one of these people whose severed limb is on the left. Why do you think we've been given these little breadcrumbs, most of which during highly impactful parts of the overarching narrative, that by themselves don't seem to amount to much, but keep pointing to a kind of power family within the Warframe story that I think is only going to get stronger with each piece revealed? It makes me wonder if the story is going to evolve into a kind of mommy versus daddy thing, with both one in custody, right now both of them trying to play nice after the events of the new war. From what we know of Duviri, the man in the wall is coming for whatever he believes he's owed. And based on what I've shown today, I wonder if we aren't the only one who had to make a deal. And further, what that might have cost her. Maybe a hand? Maybe her ability to procreate? A little bit of both? It's tough to say, but probably a good thing for our surrogate parents to be fighting, because can you imagine what could happen if they're on the same side? What force could stand against this family, given that really every other major faction in the game has already been severely weakened, if not completely decimated? And was that always the point? With that being said, I hope you all enjoyed today's video, and it got you thinking about whose side we're on, if there even are sides anymore. At any rate, I hope you all have a wonderful day today, a wonderful rest of your week, and I'll talk at you all in the next one. Take care, everybody. Bye.